Well, hello, everyone. Good to see everyone joining. I'm seeing the chat here on the right hand side, folks uh, starting to join in. Um, if you can hear me, OK, if somebody would just give me a, a thumbs up, just make sure everything is working OK. Um, um, yes, good, good. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Sandra. Yes. Um, so and Alyssa. And thanks for joining me. For got folks from all over the country here joining us. Uh, this is great. Uh, I've just been blown away by the number of people that have signed up for this webinar, and hopefully we're going to have room for everybody. One of the one of the downsides of this platform. It's a new platform for me to use. So um, bear with me. You know, hopefully we're not going to run into too many technical difficulties as we go through this. Hi, Livia. Uh, and then Olivia and Jen and Alyssa, great to see you guys. Glad you're here. And uh, I'll keep this chat uh, box open here on the side. And just as you as you join us here, I'll keep it open for a little while because I don't want to. Uh, one of the things I'll know I know would happen for me uh, because I tend to get uh, easily distracted if I keep it open during the webinar or during this uh, this class it'll distract me and I'll get off topic. So I don't want that to happen. But as you're joining, as folks are joining in, I'm going to try to be mindful of people's time. Um, this is, I'm going to keep this, try to keep this to an hour or less. And um, as we get into the webinar more, I think if you scroll down on your page, you'll see a place to ask questions. And if you have questions, um, and uh, we'll try to, we'll try to get to those at the end. Um, I see that some folks have already started asking questions, which is great. And so I'll keep the questions open during the webinar, but I'll get to those at the end. Um, and so, um, I see there's one question there about niche specialty marketing and niche kit. Uh, to kind of talk about marketing a niche specialty. I'm not going to get on that topic today. Marketing is a wholly different kind of area here. This particular webinar is specifically about um, just going to be about um, the money side of private practice. So, um, so my clock is showing that it's noon already. So I'm going to jump in here and we'll get started with the webinar. So um, let me open the open the slides here. Um, can everyone, if somebody would just real quickly say, make sure that everybody can see the slides there on the screen. Okay, good, thanks. Thanks guys for letting me know that. So um, for now, I'm gonna turn off the chat um, and that way I won't get distracted by it as we go through uh, this this webinar, um, as I mentioned in the emails, one of the things that we will um, we will have available this webinar again for a few uh, for a few days afterwards for those of you that inadvertently might have to leave the live webinar or if you have friends that haven't had a chance to didn't get to join us for the live event, there will be a replay of the webinar. So, um, let's jump into this. So uh, thanks for joining me and thanks for being patient with me with this new platform. I'm quite honestly, I'm just a little nervous about it because I haven't used it before, but hopefully everything's working okay. Okay, so today in this webinar, in this master class, whichever you prefer to call it, what we're going to be talking about are just some set different things around uh, some concepts around the financial side of private practice. One of the things about private practice um, for most of us in this field, in the helping professions, and I would include in that uh, mental health counselors, uh, marriage and family therapists, licensed professional counselors, uh, social workers, psychologists, even maybe even some other professions like um, uh, chiropractors or massage therapists, all of those, all of these different professions, most of us, uh, for the most part, receive little or no training in 
how to manage the money side of things. And then in my own journey and being in private practice for now here nearly 15 years, when I first started, I knew very little about this. So my purpose in starting this webinar and also the Money Matters in Private Practice course, which I'm going to tell you more about that here at the end, was to teach people those, those skills, that knowledge, those things that we really didn't learn in glad school. So in, to, in this webinar today, here's what I hope to hope to get to all of this and cover. Well, first of all, we're going to start with understanding our money mindset. We all have a certain way of thinking about money. And so I want to talk a little bit about that um, in this. I'm also going to kind of show you, I'm going to show you a formula or a way to begin to understand your numbers or your financial the financial side of things and and being able to know what you're we're going to talk about KPIs in other words your key performance indicators and what that means and how you can begin to understand your numbers to create a plan for yourself of getting you to where you want to be financially uh, we're also going to talk about a little bit about session rates, about being able to cover your costs and paying yourself, being able to cover taxes, all of those kinds of things. Also, we're going to talk about, I uh, want to introduce you to a concept. Uh, it's really, uh, if any of you listen to the podcast, you've heard me talk about Mike Michalowicz and Profit First. Uh, and it is uh, something that does just... Um, just something that's really changed the way I do my own finances in my practice and just talk about some of that. Um, also, we're going to be talking about um, being able to grow and scale for the long haul. In other words, what it takes to be able to sustain your practice and make sure that it is there uh, long term. And then finally, we're going to talk about I'm going to introduce you to the full course that I've got out now and talk about some discounts you can get with the course uh, for taking part in this in this particular webinar and also some bonus tools that I'm going to be giving uh, with that. So let's jump into this, um, into talking about the money mindset. And um, if you'll excuse me, I, I might cough a little bit here. I'm real prone to allergies and so... Um, I've got I've got my water here and try not to be coughing too much. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. So money mindset. You know, all of us have different ideas about money. And a lot of it has to do with what we grew up with and how we began to think about money. And so one of the things I want you to do is maybe begin to think to yourself about um, what you've learned about money so far in life. Um, in my own in my own case, one of the things uh, in my growing up and just my ideas about money, um, my my parents never were really great money managers. My dad was a pastor. And so his idea of money about how you acquired money and got money was really based on the generosity of others and being able to um, depend on, uh, in his case, church members to give money to the church. And then the leaders of the church would determine what he would get paid. And so in many ways, I grew up with the idea that money was outside my own hands. It was just dependent on the on the generosity of others and that we we uh, got money through just the goodness of other people. Well, needless to say that um, that doesn't get you very far. And my parents, despite the fact that they're good people, they never really planned for their retirement well. And, um, you know, I think another thing, too, is that when people grow up, um, maybe folks that grow up um, in poverty or grow up in, in situations where there's always been a money har uh, hardship, we have a certain way to think about money. The other thing that happens with our money mindset is that we can tend to have what I call money shame. In other words, um, if you think about it, our... Um, 
what we make and our salary and our financial situation is a very personal thing. And it's something that we only share with a few number of people. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because it is a personal issue, but we can tend to have some shame around that in terms of, of uh, you know, if you don't feel like you have enough money or if you feel like uh, you're not making what you, what you feel like you're worth, um, that can all have an effect on our money mindset. And um, the other thing about money, our money mindset is that um, our work culture and within our society, a person's worth tends to be measured by how much they make or how rich or affluent they have. And so uh, affluence they have. And so all of that ties into our money mindset. And so one of the things I want us to maybe begin to do is begin to think about it a little differently. Um, money is really just a tool. It's just something that we can use to get us the things that we want in life. And so I think a better place to begin is to begin to think about the lifestyle we want for ourselves. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so think about that for yourself. What is the lifestyle that you want for yourself? Do you... Um, do you want to, do you aspire to have a certain size house, a certain car? I know for me, the lifestyle that I choose is uh, I've got a comfortable house and a comfortable place to live. I, I'm able to go on vacations to the places I want to go on vacations. Um, we were able to put our, our daughter through college. Um, we, um, if I want to go out to eat somewhere, I don't really have to worry of whether or not I have the money for that. And all of those things are really tied into lifestyle. And so I want, to, want you to really be realistic about that. Um, for us to think about, well, I just want to be rich one day. Well, what does that mean to you? What does that mean in terms of your value of money and, and where you want to be? And so one of the things that I think is... A, is important to know as we begin to formulate this whole financial financial idea surrounding our practices is to really begin to understand, okay, how much money do you actually need in order to maintain your lifestyle? And so um, let's think about that a little more. The place to begin is in knowing our numbers. Um, and really understanding where you are now with your financial situation. And one of the problems is, is that we tend not to want to know that. We tend to hide from our numbers. We, um, it's almost like one of those things that just I'd rather not know. And I know for, for several years, I kind of operated that way. You know, I would look at my bank account and make decisions based on what was in my bank account, but that really wasn't a good way of really thinking about my financial situation. Um, and so I think really the place to start is to really have an understanding of, of your lifestyle and, and how much money you actually need in order to maintain that lifestyle. It would take, it takes just a little bit of work to really kind of look at all of that. You pull out your bank statements, you look at what you're spending money on, you look at what you can cut out, you look at uh, what you really want to keep, all of those kinds of things. And that has a lot to do with what your lifestyle will be for yourself. So, the way that we get there in private practice is there's some, some key performance indicators, and that's just referred to as KPIs. And these are the things that for most people in their private practices, you need to kind of have a pulse on these particular things to really kind of understand how to develop a, a financial plan for things. And so those things are, of course, your overhead, which is just simply, overhead means just simply what it costs to keep your business open, to keep your practice open. Then you also need to know what is your per session rate or your average per session rate. In other words, what do people pay you for sessions? Um, for those of us that are 
um, insurance based with our practices um, that can vary. That can be a moving target, but you can figure out what is your average per session rate over a period of time. Also, you need to know the number of sessions that you're going to be having each week. And I know for some of you out there, you might be in that kind of those beginning stages and you're trying to get the number of sessions you have each week up. Um, the other thing that you need to know is just what do you need to pay yourself? And that goes back to the lifestyle and kind of the salary you want for yourself. The other thing that you have to take into consideration or what do you have to pay for taxes? Um, because all of us at some point or another do have to pay our, our taxes. And so you've got to have an understanding of that. And then the other part of that is profit. And that's just, that is what you use to build a residual for yourself, but also is what determines the financial health of any business. It has to be profitable. So the place to begin is to really, I like to think of it as being able to, to work backwards and really kind of understanding, again, thinking about your lifestyle and the salary you would like for yourself. And that, and what, I, what I mean by that is just knowing where you're going. So I want to share with you an interesting statistic. I looked this up a few weeks ago, and the average salary for counselors and therapists in the United States is around almost $43,000 a year. So with that figure in mind, now obviously there are people that are making much less than that, people that are making much more than that, depending on where you are in the country. But I wanted to kind of have this figure figure in mind uh, to maybe give you kind of a, a place to compare. Um, this doesn't mean that you should be making this. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be making this. Just giving you a reference point by giving you this statistic. So what are your numbers? Let's think about that. Okay, I want to give you some an example here. First of all, you need to gather your data. Um, and what I mean by that is have an understanding about what you want to pay yourself, what your per session rate is uh, currently in terms of um, how much do you get per session. For those of you that are private pay, that is going to be a... Um, a set rate, you know that for every session, but for, like I mentioned earlier, for those of us that are insurance based, that could be a moving target. That could be something that's going to be kind of vary from case to case. And so having an understanding of your average over time, the more data you have, of course, the more accurate the number you're going to have um, is to understand that. Also having an understanding of what your number of sessions is, your average number of sessions each week or each month of really kind of having an understanding of that. The other data that you're going to need to have is an understanding of your operating costs. What does it keep, how much money does it take to keep your practice going? And that would be things like your rent, your telephone, you know, for, for those of us that us um, office administrators or office help. Um, also, for those of us that are in group practices, what we have to pay other therapists, all of those things are the cost of maintaining the business, you know, insurance, all of those things are, are part of the op operating cost. And then your taxes, which has a really, um, again, I won't have time to go into this in, in this uh, particular webinar, but our taxes for those of us that are self-employed are really based on what our net profit is. And again, uh, that's a that's a kind of a financial term. It just means your your income, your total income, your total revenue um, minus your expenses equals your profit. That's the traditional way of thinking about it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here uh, when we get to the profit first section. So here's an example, or here's a formula rather. Um, the formula that I like to use when uh, working with people and just beginning to think about a financial plan, as I mentioned earlier, is just starting, uh, starting from the end point and working backwards from there. So 
think about what you want your ideal salary to be. What would you like to uh, essentially make from your practice every year? Then you divide it by the number of weeks that you want to work. I always think of 48 weeks as a good good place because most of us want to be able to take some time off during the year. And so 52 weeks in the year. And so we just um, keep it at 48, 48. That's uh, about four weeks of vacation or four weeks of time off. Then your weekly operating costs of the practice. In other words, what it costs each week to, to keep your practice open. Also thinking about what taxes you might have to pay um, fr from your business. It might be obviously in, in, in the United States, for those of you that are from the uh, United States, we have to pay the IRS every April 15th. We have to file our taxes. And so a portion of what we make is taxed. And depending on the state that you live in, you've got income tax there. The other taxes you have to think about too, and uh, depending on where you are in the country or in the world, you might have different business taxes that you have to pay. So I just, I point that out because that's, that could be folded in under operating costs, but I think it's good to kind of separate it out. Then you take all of this and then you divide it by your average per session rate. And then that gives you an idea of the number of sessions you need to have each week in order to meet that that fi those financial goals. So let's see what this would look like. Here's the example. Say you wanted to make a $50,000 a year salary and you divide that by the number of weeks in the that you want to work and so you come up with the figure $1,041. Then you would add to that your weekly expenses, as in this example here. Um, so I just came up with a figure of $500 a week. So that's, uh, if you think about it, that would be an operating cost of about $2,000 a month. So um, again, this is just a hypothetical situation. Um, the taxes here in the United States, for those of us that are self-employed, the um, the taxes are usually around 18% self-employment tax. That doesn't include any state income tax that you might have to pay. But just for this example, I used 18% of the total of the total um, salary here. And so that gives you a subtotal of $1,729. Um, and so that's what you would need to make each week. And so let's break break that down into numbers of sessions. So as you can see, depending on what you charge per session is going to determine how much you have to work. Obviously, the higher the session rate, the fewer sessions you're going to have to have in a week to meet that, meet that goal. And so your session rate is really a big determinant in just thinking about this financial plan as to as to how much you're going to have to work or not, depending on where your set per session rate is. Obviously, for those of us that are on insurance panels, we have to see more clients than someone that is strictly cash pay. So here's the key with all of this and thinking about developing a financial plan and just setting some financial goals for your practice you do want to be able to get your average per session rate as high as possible that's within reason and also keep your operating costs as low as possible. And that is just, a, uh, again, there's a whole lot more detail to this than just in, I'm able to, going to be able to share in this webinar, but that's a, that's a concept that you need to kind of think about along the way. Here's the problem though. The problem is, is that as most of us know, you know, I gave that formula and it's a pretty cut and dry formula, but the problem is, is that in private practice, the, um, the number of sessions we might have every week is going to vary. We're going to hit slow periods. Here as I'm, as we're doing this webinar, it's the middle of almost the middle of July. And what I've noticed in my own practice is that things have slowed down. 
people are on vacation, people are out of town. And so we're not getting as many sessions per week as we would normally do. Being able to overcome this problem is being able to look at averages and percentages to get us there. So I'm going to switch gears here and let's talk about the power of allocation or using allocation and percentages. And, and I like to refer to this as, as profit first because this concept, uh, in many ways, this concept I got from Mike Michalowicz. What I'm, I'm going to tell you a little more about his, his things here. Allocation is really just the, the way I like to think about allocation is, is that for every dollar that comes into your practice or comes into your business, you're going to give it a job. You're going to allocate it or put it into a particular bucket. It's like organizing your money. And the thing I love about allocation is it keeps you from having to do a budget each time. In other words, trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to budget this amount of money uh, for this thing and this amount of money. Instead of using specific amounts of money to, to allocate, what works better is to use percentages. So Mike Michalowicz, and I highly recommend this book, and if you'll go back and listen to some of the older episodes of the Practice of Therapy podcast, I actually interview Mike Michalowicz, and he um, talks a little bit about his story. And this book has really been transformational for me in my own practice, in particular in thinking about money. In many ways, it's what inspired me to, to put together the Money Matters course, because I realized that most people, a lot of people in private practice really just don't understand how to handle the money side of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's the concept. It's a different way about thinking about profit. You know, the traditional accounting way of thinking about profit comes from this idea that all the income we get, our gross income, minus our expenses equals profit. Well, Mike Michalowicz turns that on its head, and he says a better way to go about this is to really take our profit first. In other words, make sure we're paying ourselves first and then adjust our expenses to, um, to be able to uh, maintain that profit. So here, here's a little bit more about that. Mike Michalowicz talks about the Parkinson's law, which is uh, doesn't have anything to do with the disease, but another guy by the name of Parkinson's Parkinson that, that said the demand of a resource tends to match the supply of a resource. So if you think about it, I like to, uh, when I, when I go to the movies, um, one of the things uh, I love to do is get popcorn and the amount of popcorn I eat is going to solely depend on the size bag I get, get because I'll eat every bit of it every single time. And so if our expenses, if we're creating a lot of expenses for ourselves, we're going to use all of that. We're going to use that up and we're going to, we're going to take advantage of that. So what Mike says that is a better way to do this is to really kind of cut down on our expenses, but really be disciplined enough that when we get our income is to begin to, is to take our profit first take that percentage first off the top rather than what is than what is left over. And that's where the whole profit first idea is different. And that rather than living off of or using only what is left, we take it off the top, take it from the beginning, and then make our expenses use what is left. So in other words, the size of your bucket determines what you will spend. So the key to this idea of allocations to profit first is to control the size of your buckets. So here's, here's a little visual for you. So obviously in our practices, whatever comes in as income, that's at 100%. And then we take that money 
we allocate 5% to profit, 30% to operating expenses, 50% to owner's compensation, and 15% to taxes. Now, this is just, a again, an example. And this these percentages are going to vary depending on your situation because every everyone's situation is a little different. So being able to know how to get to these percentages, though, is the key. So the other concept that Mike McCallowitz came up with is really looking at what you're spending now. Like I said in the beginning and just thinking about creating a financial plan, gathering that data and just looking at how you're, how you're allocating things now is a starting place. And it, those are what he refers to as your caps or your current allocation percentages. But then you want to move towards a targeted allocation percentages over time. The beauty of the profit first system that I like so much is that you can take your time doing it. There's not a sense of urgency. And so let me show you, give you an example here that will kind of show how this works. So you first of all, calculating your cap. So let's say in this particular practice, their total income for the year, in other words, from sessions and everything that they bring in for the year's $120,000. So they made a profit of $2,000 for the year using the old, old system of income minus expenses equals profit. So in this example, they had a 1.6% profit, which isn't, isn't too bad because they made a profit. That's good. If this was a negative number, that would not be, not be good. They paid uh, $3,000 in taxes, so that's 2.5%. They paid themselves $25,000 out of that $120,000, which was 20%. And then their operating costs were 75% of what they brought in. So that may or may not be high, depending on the situation. But as you can see, with these percentages, um, there's some wiggle room here if we shuffle the money around. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's an example of a targeted image. So in this example, we would want to switch from, begin to move from 1.6% to 5%. <clears throat> Instead of 25 for taxes, we'd move that up to 15%. The owner's compensation, we'd want to move from 209 to 50% and then reduce our operating costs by 30%. And so it's, again, it's a, a matter of, of designating what, the, what buckets the money goes into. So in order to work towards allocation goals, what you want to do is continue working to increase your income. So two ways to do that, obviously, is one, you can raise your session rates, or number two is just get more sessions. And so finding that balance, kind of finding that magic magic spot there. Um, you want to be able to work towards decreasing your operating expenses. So really going through with a fine tooth comb and looking at how you're spending your money and what you're spending it on to operate your, your business um, can have a big effect on that. One thing that Mike McCallowitz always says to do is, allocate something to profit, even if you're only starting at 1%. And I know when I first started doing this in my own practice, I started at, uh, I think I was able to start at 2% that I would allocate each, each month to a profit account. And so, and then while you're growing, allocate to build the buffer and reserves for slow times. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as well. Um, one of the things, one of the big mistakes that people make in private practice is they don't create a financial buffer for themselves. And okay, well, so let's talk about that a little bit more. So in thinking about growing and scaling for the long haul, um, as, I'm, as I introduced here, adopting a profit first system or adopting some systems to manage your money is something that's an important piece. So first, 
financial buffer and cushion for yourself in your practice. When I first started my private practice, I really did it part time. I was still working for an agency at the time. I was starting to seek private clients in the evenings and on weekends. Fortunately, in my situation, the agency I worked with worked exclusively with children and youth. And so I I didn't have a conflict of interest by seeing adults and, and families in the evenings, adults and couples rather. And so I started doing that in the evenings and on weekends. And when I made the decision to move into full-time private practice, I knew that I needed to have a financial buffer. And it's a good idea, kind of as a general rule, I think it's a good idea to have at the very least two months of salary and operating costs saved in order to float your practice during those slow times, to have that reserve. More is better, probably, you know, a better a, a, a better cushion would be six months to a year worth of um, your salary and operating expenses saved away in an account that you don't touch, that you have there just for emergencies and getting you through those slow times. So in thinking about a financial plan, as I mentioned, you want to create a financial buffer uh, and reserves for yourself. The other thing about thinking ahead and thinking about um, financial planning is you want to limit your, uh, your debt as much as possible uh, and as soon as possible. I know for a lot of people, we've got like uh, graduate school loans and all of those things. And I didn't mention this at the beginning, but obviously as a private practice owner and somebody in business for themselves, there's a lot of overlap between our personal life and our business life. And one of the things that is a huge killer for people is if they are in debt. And so in addition to building those reserves, you want to get your debt as low as possible as you move into private practice. Um, and really thinking about that ahead of time. Um, I would say, and this is, again, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent. You want to be able to um, uh, not put yourself in a financial bind, bind when you go into private practice. And I think uh, my philosophy is, is that slow incremental growth is that is usually better than just some huge fast growth. Um, it just zaps our energy stores by do it, trying to do that. Um, start saving and investing in retirement. Again, um, I, I know my radar screen. Um, and, but I think one mistake I see people make is they don't think about that soon enough. Um, really the time to start saving for retirement was yesterday. <laughs> um, so start doing that as soon as possible. So taking a percentage of what you make, what you pay yourself and putting it into some sort of retirement plan. You know, when we work for somebody else, a lot of times they contribute for us, but being in private practice, being your own boss, yeah, that has to change. Also being able to think about a diversity of in income streams, being able to think outside the box. Um, I had a podcast episode with my friend David Hall last week, and that was one of the things we talked about, is being able to think about other ways to create income for your practice and for yourself, other than just the traditional face-to-face -face contact that we do in sessions where we're trading our time and expertise for money. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, one of the things that I'm doing just with this is I'm creating another, another form of income through the courses that I sell. Um, another way to make extra income would be to um, host some, excuse me. <coughs> oh, I'm very sorry. Um, is to host like a continuing education event or something like that. So um, those are things that you can do. Um, the other thing to think about in, um, in creating a financial plan is to think about what is the right size practice for you. 
Um, there was the book that I inter again, I interviewed a guy by the name of Paul Jarvis uh, a few weeks ago and his book company of one. I, the thing about that book that just really was uh, struck home for me and kept me was just um, being able to find the right size for your practice. Um, your practice needs to fit your lifestyle. For some people, they we aspire to grow this huge practice, a huge uh, volume of clients. And if that's what you want to do, great, go for it. But I think for a lot of us, um, we really only want a sort, certain size practice. And I think knowing what lifestyle you want to keep for yourself can determine that as much as anything. The other thing in creating a financial plan for yourself is really be sure to consult with financial experts and um, financial planners. Um, find other people that have been there ahead of you in terms of mentors and coaches, but do, do discuss your financial plans with experts. So what's next? Let's think about this. I'm, I'm trying to keep a, a, a mind, mindful of the time here. One of the things about uh, this stuff that I've introduced here, again, I've just kind of hit the highlights. And one of the things that I know that probably, and we're going to leave time here at the end for, for questions, is that a lot of you probably have a lot more questions and a lot more things uh, to ask about this. And one of the things that you'll probably want to do is just learn is to dive in deeper to all of this. Good news is, is there's a way to do that. And the way that we're get, that I have, have done this is I've put together a course. And the course is the Money Matters and Private Practice course. And in that that I cover, um, let me go over to this slide. What are some of the things that you need to know how to do in order to be totally financial uh, secure in your practice is you need to know some basic accounting concepts. Um, one of the other things that I cover in the course are just about business entities and being able to understand how to protect yourself in your business in terms of uh, forming an LLC or a, an S Corp, those kinds of things. Uh, and as you grow, that's something you really need to consider. The other thing that you'll learn in the course is just some more specifics about bookkeeping and understanding a report. If um, if your accountant or your bookkeeper were to hand you a profit and loss statement for your um, for your practice, would you know how to read it? Um, and that's a that's an important piece is just to be able to look at your numbers and look at your data and understand what is there. The other thing too is to understand how taxes are different for someone that is self-employed and that's covered in the course. The other thing too is just thinking about setting our fees, uh, really figuring out and diving deep into what fees to charge for your services. As we talked about here in this masterclass, this webinar, it's important to maybe get your fee structure as high as possible depending on the demographics of your area and what is a fair price to charge people. The other thing that the course does is it gets into more detailed financial planning and just thinking about how you're going to structure your finances, how you're going to budget, how you're going to set your allocation percentages. Um, and again, we talk about that in more detail in the course. And so also we talk about in about hiring other people to join your, your practice, about hiring contractors and employees and all the things that you need to know around that. There's two different ways to, um, to go about hiring people. You can hire them as an independent contractor, which has one tax implication as, ver as opposed to employees, which is another tax implication. And then finally, too, just planning for retirement. Again, for a lot of folks, I know a lot of you out there uh, are maybe a little younger than me, but uh, this is probably not something that's on our radar screen as much. So the big thing I want you to, uh, hopefully this webinar has done, is to maybe begin, begin to get you to think about how you can feel confident 
about the financial side of things. And again, the course is going to get you, get you there quicker. There's so much information to cover. The course itself is a, a little over six hours of instruction of just going through some things in detail. So here's the pitch. <laughs> um, want to let you know what I'm, what I'm offering to folks that are listening to the webinar, and then we're going to get to your questions. I want you to, to, to learn about this. I'm going to let me put up uh, something here so you have a quick link to get to where, where, the, where, um, where this offer is. For those of you that are listening uh, to this webinar or taking this webinar, the Financial Management and Private Practice course, the Money Matters and Private Practice course, is uh, normally two, $297, or you could do four monthly payments of $75. But since you've joined the webinar today, I'm going to give you a 25% off that. And so what you would do is using the link that's probably on your screen now is um, use that link. Uh, the Again, you can go to practiceoftherapy.com. I've got another slide here with a specific URL. You can get that. Plus, I'm going to include in this course, um, when you get the course, a profit first tracking spreadsheet that will help you. It's just simply a Google sheet that's got the percentages there that you can change around and use to begin to look at this. Now, this offer is going to, I'm going to keep this open until July 20th. And I'm going to also include in this discount the G Suite for Therapist course that I have available. And the G Suite for Therapist course is just simply a course that teaches you how to use um, the tools of Google G Suite. Um, which if you've got a Google account, you've got the tools of Google G Suite available to you um, and how to use that in setting up systems and processes for your, for your practice and use that in your practice um, to manage your practice. Um, again, it's uh, that, that course is normally $98 and or you can do three payments of $38. And with the discount, um, and again, the discount code is Gordon25, G-O-R-D-O-N-2-5. You can save $24.50 on that. Or one thing that I've done, too, to save you even more is put a bundle of both courses. And so normally if you had those courses together, um, it would be about $395. But I'm giving... Uh, the course bundle discount, which is $349, and then the four, or you can do four monthly payments of $90, and you'll save about $46 off the total there, this $349. Um, and then with the coupon code, you end up saving $133. So take advantage of that. Um, again, there's the URL, practiceoftherapy.com slash courses and then use the coupon code GORDON25. Um, again, if you got what you needed from this webinar, great. Um, but if you want to dive in a little deeper, this course is there for you for that. So I would encourage you to take care of that discount and then also get that um, uh, Profit First Allocation Spreadsheet that will be included in that. So questions. I'm going to move over here and see what our questions are for this. If you'll scroll down at the bottom of your page, and I'm going to turn the chat back on too, but if you'll ask your questions down at the bottom, um, this would uh, I'll hopefully get to some of these things. So uh, first of all, hi, Joe from Princeton, New Jersey. You are in there. Let's see. Ann asked this question. Anything you can say about startup costs? <coughs> One of the things, if you haven't gotten it already, I do have a free private practice startup guide and you can go to the website, practiceoftherapy.com and you'll see links all over the place for there. And I talk a lot about that in there um, in terms of startup costs. Obviously your biggest cost in starting um, 
a private practice is going to be your office or where you choose to see people. Um, one way around uh, some of that is to be able to, um, I'm going to close these slides out here so you can maybe see me. I'm not sure if you saw me during uh, during the presentation or not, but your startup cost, your biggest one, of course, is going to be what kind of leash you have. One of the things that is a good way around that is that, um, is that you can um, maybe sublease from somebody. Um, in other words, uh, one, I, I had a friend of mine that I was doing some supervision with uh, that uh, found a doctor, a doctor who had some extra space that wasn't being used in a doctor's office. And so they started seeing clients in that doctor's office. And it was, uh, uh, I think they even worked it out to where they didn't, um, have to pay much at all for the use of that office. So that's one way around kind of keeping those startup costs uh, kind of low. Um, another idea is to really think about doing um, practice, private practice kind of unconventionally, like teletherapy, that sort of thing. Um, hopefully, Felice, you were able to, um, able to see and hear me uh, get that worked out. Um, Tracy, yes, the webinar is going to be available. You should be getting after the webinar is over, maybe tomorrow, that will give you access to the replay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Amy, you had trouble hearing um, hear, hearing the, um, the slides. Hopefully, again, those technical difficulties you were able to get worked through. Um, and, and sorry, again, this is a new, new um new uh, platform for me and hopefully it's working okay. So Nathan asked uh, about the average salary. Is that salary net or gross? I'm assuming that that is a gross salary. Um, in other words, what um, somebody would make uh, in terms of benefits included if they were working for someone else or even in private practice. And that uh, that figure was around $42,000 a year. I think that's what you're asking, uh, uh, Nathan. Um, yes, uh, Lila, I'll make the slides available uh, after the webinar. We'll make sure that those are posted and that you have access to those. Um, yes, Teresa, we'll do the, have the, the web uh, slides available. I think several people asked that question. Um, yeah, so Susanna, you talked to, had, had a question. Talk a little bit more about diversifying income. One of the, one of the things about private practices is that we um, are we are changing. Uh, we we exchange our time and expertise for money, and our typical way of of providing services is to have that one-on-one -on -one contact in a session, whether it be a 50-minute session, 60-minute session. And so that's the traditional way for, and just really the bulk of the ways that most of us as therapists make our money. Some ways to diversify income would be to maybe consider doing groups. That way you're trading um, your, your time to many at the same time. And so it's a it's a bigger bang for the buck, so to speak. But there's lots of different ways to really kind of think about um, uh, diversifying your income. Like I mentioned in the in the webinar is doing things like this, doing doing webinars, creating courses around a particular topic that you maybe have some expertise in. Another one, and again, I mentioned this in the webinar is that uh, maybe consider looking into doing some continuing education events where there's a particular thing that you're passionate about and going through the process of finding out from in your state what you can do to provide those continuing education things. Uh, another, there, there are lots of opportunities online for doing things through blogging, uh, through um, um, lots of different areas. Um, if you go back in, again, a look at some of the, the older issues of the podcast, you can find out some more ideas about that. Uh, so the, I guess my point being with that, uh, Susanna, is being able to um, get away from, not get away from, but in addition to trading your time for um, 
for um, it's trading your time for money is that you have other maybe passive ways to bring in income, you know, writing a book, those kinds of things. So, um, okay. So good question, Sandra, you're asking about the, uh, the course, the course is an on demand course. So once you sign up for the course and you purchase the course, you have unlimited access to it and you can take it at any time and take your time with it and pace yourself with the course. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned, the course is about six hours, at least six or seven hours of video. Uh, that's a lot to sit down and do in one sitting. I don't know that I would, but really the way I designed the course is there's um, about eight modules, 10 modules there. And each course is, each section of the course is broken out there. If you go to that link, practiceoftherapy.com um, slash courses, you can click on the course there and scroll down and see the curriculum for the course to give you an idea of what's included. So um, <coughs> how does, uh, Kelly asks, how does a sliding scale fee play into planning? And do you limit how many people you provide a sliding scale? And how do you decide how much to reduce the cost? Great question, Kelly. Love that question. In my practice, I do have a sliding scale fee. And here's how I determine. No, first of all, I think the importance about a sliding scale is to make sure that your lowest rung of that scale or the lowest part of that scale is at least your average per session rate. I think it's important to be able to offer people that need it discounted service. And even, even in those times that we need to give uh, pro bono um, services, just not charge somebody for services. But I think a good idea with a sliding scale is to make your lowest, uh, lowest part of that sliding scale uh, close to your average per session rate. Now, let, let me clarify that a little bit. For those of us that are on insurance panels, our per session rate, average per session rate, is going to be lower than somebody that is um, uh, uh, strictly cash pay. Um, that's just the way it works out mathematically. But um, with your sliding scale, I don't think you need to have too many categories there. But again, if you have a sliding scale, you're going to be able to, you know, hopefully if it's if it's done right, you're um, you're going to be able to judge what you need to have. So uh, hopefully that's answering your question. Uh, as far as limiting the number of people that you provide the sliding scale fee for, um, there's some ethical issues around that. If you're going to offer a sliding scale fee, you need to offer it to everyone. And the way I work it in my practice and what's stated clearly in our paperwork and everywhere else is that if you don't have insurance or choose not to use your insurance, you get to do the sliding scale fee. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And, and so that way I'm not competing, with, you know, if a person, I leave it up to the client whether they want to use their insurance or not. If they don't have insurance, then we offer them the sliding scale. Um, I make it really simple and don't uh, don't try to do a you know financial check or anything. I just do the honor system on that. <coughs> Joe um, asked uh, about health insurance. The best way to get health insurance. That is a tough one, Joe. Uh, one of one of the things uh, you know. Fortunately, right now we've got the. Uh, Affordable Care, uh, Affordable Care Act is still in place. Uh, that's what I've been using for my own practice is the ACA stuff. Um, that's that's fairly affordable. One of the things that you might want to do is just contact a, an insurance agent about that. Um, if you're going to have a group health insurance, you're going to have to actually have a group and employees that are willing to. Uh, uh, do um, be on that with you. But that's a tough one. And that's something I hope to address in the future about what are some best ways to get health insurance if you're self-employed. It's a tough, tough thing. For, sorry, I don't have a straightforward answer there. Um, 
Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Is it? Uh, let's see. Agatha, I, I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. Why don't you shoot me an email and elaborate that? My email is Gordon at practiceoftherapy.com. Agatha from Kenya asks, is it possible to pay slowly until you reach the full target? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. I'm not sure what you're exactly what you're asking, but if you can uh, just shoot me an email and I'll try to get to that. Um, have you ever had any success in negotiating higher? Nathan asked, uh, have you ever had any success in negotiating higher rates from the insurance companies? Um, yes, I have. Um, as a matter of fact, it's um, one of the things that I do is I look at each year, kind of look at where we are. And what I would say do is contact your local uh, representative for each insurance company and just give them a proposal. Some will just laugh at you, some will not. But I think if you've got a specific niche and a specific population, particularly if it's a specialty, you can get get them to raise your rates. Um, also, too, you know, if you get a, I, I've turned down some insurance companies uh, just because their rates were too low. I, I got, uh, in particular, some EAP panels that I was on. They were not willing to go up on their rates of what they paid me. I just said, well, sorry, I can't be on your panel. <coughs> so Jennifer asks, how much does the Money Matters course cover um, to help you decide whether to hire a 1099 independent contractor therapist or employees? Uh, therapist for a group. Quite a bit in there. There's a whole lesson on that particular particular topic about pros and cons of hiring contractors versus employees and things that you need to know about that. So uh, the simple answer is yes, that's covered in the course. Whole lesson on that. Um, and then finally, Hansi, I think I'm saying your name correctly, Hansi, do you have any issues with charging for sessions that get canceled at the last minute? And do you have a process for that? And do you have agreed to rules about it with your clients? Yes, absolutely. It's covered um, covered in the informed consent, and it's highlighted in yellow, uh, yellow highlighter, that if they cancel, if they no-show for, um, for a session, or they cancel right before the session or cancel cancel late, we have a 24-hour cancellation policy, they will be charged for the session. And with my, um, one of the things that I've got as well is being able to um, keep credit cards on file and I have a policy around that. So keep credit cards on file. If they miss the session, we charge their credit card. Um, again, that's um that's uh, that's a whole other topic in and of itself, but that's the way around it. And then also having um, an automated system that sends reminders. And that what I use in my practice is therapy notes, and all of that is integrated in that system as a process. So let's see. Um, uh, uh, so another the follow up question is, is: Will you charge them for any excuse or reason? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think, yeah, I handle it on a case by case basis. You know, obviously people are going to have things come up. Kids get sick, those kinds of things. So we're flexible around those things. But uh, in particular, I charge people that are kind of chronic cancelers and chronic late comers or no shows. Those are the ones that we really look at. So um, let's see, I'm looking real quickly at the, um, at the comments over here. Um, yes. So thanks Nathan for that comment, just about um, collecting the credit card beforehand. So, okay. So we're at an hour and four minutes. I said, I wanted to stop uh, at an hour or a little over that. Thank you all so much for joining the the webinar. I hopefully you've gotten some great information out of this, and I appreciate you joining me. Shoot me an email, leave me some comments, all those kinds of things. This will be available for replay later, and I'll also make sure that I can get those uh, those slides out there to you. So. 
Well, folks, have a great weekend. Have a great um, week ahead. And thanks again for joining me for the for the podcast. Thanks, guys.